It is my pleasure to introduce Christopher Rowland, Dean Ireland Professor of the Exegesis of Holy Scripture at the University of Oxford and Fellow of the Queen's College, Oxford. For those of you who were here yesterday, you know that Professor Rowland is giving us uh, a, a slice of the history of interpretation where most of us never thought to look for it. Whereas it's been popular, increasingly popular in the past 15 or 20 years to think about how scripture has been read and interpreted in various eras, most of us have not thought to look to William Blake, the poet and prophet, as part of that history of interpretation. And yet, as was made abundantly clear yesterday, Blake belongs uh, among the most insightful, if eccentric, interpreters of scripture. Today, Professor Rowland will take us into a visual exegesis of some of Blake's art and think about what light that might cast on Jesus and perhaps Jesus as antinomian. So I introduce to you our Schaefer lecturer for 2008, Christopher Rowland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you all for coming back. It's all very, always very encouraging to see faces <laughs> of the audience again. In the first lecture, we've already looked at Blake's images. But yesterday, I used the images to illuminate Blake's texts. Today, the images take center stage, and uh, they are going to dominate what it is I'm going to be looking at. We saw how Blake juxtaposed text and image and produced versions of the same basic image and text with varying colors. Throughout, there's a sense that what one sees in an image is not just an illustration of what one reads, but a necessary complement to it, and indeed gives a hermeneutical steer to the words. We're going to see, I hope later in this lecture, Blake playing with some familiar words from the book of Job. I have heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee as the key to the presentation of text and image in his engravings for the book of Job, which he completed shortly before his death. And if you ask, well, what's he doing looking at the book of Job in a series of lectures on the life, character, and teaching of Jesus? I hope it will become apparent when we get there. Like John of Patmos, whose sight of a lamb as it had been slain interprets what he heard about the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, that hath prevailed, Blake has Job allowing visionary experience to interpret and indeed challenge received wisdom. To understand Blake's interpretation of the life, character and teaching of Jesus calls for this more focused consideration of the images related to this theme and this forms the heart of today's lecture. From 1799 to 1805, Blake painted two series of biblical subjects for Thomas Butts. Thomas Butts is a great hero uh, for anybody connected with William Blake because uh, Butts' commissioning and supportive attitude towards Blake, I think, uh, saved him from penury. One of these series is intemperate and one of watercolour, and you'll see the difference uh, uh, very clearly uh, when we look at some of the pictures. The pictures chosen here can only give a sample of the range of biblical subjects that Blake painted. The series that Blake painted shows a variety of interests. Unsurprisingly, the visionary and the apocalyptic, focusing on the book of Revelation. And there are other clusters around the birth and infancy of Jesus, Christ and children, the passion and resurrection, Christ as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and an insistence on the spirit of mercy and forgiveness something we touched on yesterday. I want to do two things this morning. First of all, to consider some examples of Blake's visual interpretation of scenes from the Gospels, starting with Jesus' birth and concluding with the resurrection. And secondly, to approach one of these images, and with this I'm going to start, using what a reconstruction of what I consider to have been Blake's hermeneutical method to have been. And to accomplish this, I'm going to frame my consideration of one of his most enigmatic pictures with an application of the way in which I looked at and reacted to it, reflected on it, and then thought about it over months and indeed years. And it's, that's where we're going to start with the nativity. 
But first, Blake's hermeneutics. The nature of the interpretive process is briefly sketched by Blake in a letter in which he responded to criticism made by a client. Blake had been commissioned to produce several paintings for a Reverend Dr. Trussler in 1799. He painted one picture which didn't meet with the approval of Trussler, who demanded an explanation of the picture. Now, strangely, Blake responded very tartly. I say strangely because he quite clearly needed the money. And also, as a decade later, we find him being more than willing to offer what is, in effect, an interpretive key to his last judgment, a picture we'll look at um, a little bit later. Nevertheless, uh, one can be grateful that uh, he did respond tartly because Blake's rather tetchy response gives us one of the most concise statements of his hermeneutics. And you've got two extracts from this long letter here. You ought to know he says to Trussler, that what is grand is necessarily obscure to weak men. That which can be made explicit to the idiot is not worth my care. <laughs> the wisest of the ancients considered what is not too explicit as the fittest for instruction because it rouses the faculties to act. I name Moses, Solomon, Aesop, Homer and Plato. And a little bit later in the letter, he goes on, why is the Bible more entertaining and instructive than any other book? Is it not because they are addressed to the imagination, which is spiritual sensation, and but immediately to the understanding or reason? Um, notice the they there. I assume that that's because he's suddenly kind of switched to thinking of the Bible not as a kind of uh, a holistic, homogeneous whole, but a kind of collection of books. Elsewhere, Blake writes of the way he hopes viewers of his painting of The Last Judgment will identify with its details and so, in the imagination, find different perspectives on human affairs. If the spectator, he writes, could enter into these images in his imagination, approaching them on the fiery chariot of his contemplative thought, if he could enter into Noah's rainbow or into his bosom, or could make a friend or companion of one of these images of wonder, which always entreats him to leave mortal things, as he must know. Then would he arise from his grave. Then would he meet the Lord in the air. And then he would be happy. And whenever I read that passage, I immediately think of the kind of method that is suggested by Ignatius of Loyola in the spiritual exercises. In these two extracts, Blake articulates the character of aesthetic engagement and explains the balance between reason and imagination and the ways in which he would hope the spectators of his work would engage with the images. Thus, the first interpretative moment is the effect of a text or picture, rousing the faculties to act, and only secondarily, immediately, the understanding or reason. This echoes words in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, Plate 16, where Blake writes of Jesus, praying to the Father, alluding to John 14 to 16, to send the comforter or desire, he says, that reason may have ideas to build on. So, the first intellectual move is imaginative engagement, which is then looked at in the light of reason. That's the move that I want to just uh, take with you as I react to a particular image. And this is the image we're going to have a look at. I want to recall the effect that this image had on me and then consider uh, the process of reflection as my in the initial impact that this had on me was analysed and tested. So it's a kind of uh, a, a, a narrative of uh, my engagement with this picture over the years. Just have a look at it before I uh, uh, immediately... Uh, launch into uh, this narrative. When I first saw Blake's Nativity, which you can see in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, 
Um, I, when SBL was in Philadelphia, which must be three years ago, I had the opportunity to go and look at it. And uh, um, there's no doubt at all that one is missing certain things. I'll come back to those uh, in, in this uh, digital representation of it, as, as good as it is. There were three initial impressions. First, Mary swooning and the divine light coming through the window and ending up on the celestial child. I mean, if we can get this thing to work, that light coming down there, when you actually look at the picture, is much more obvious as a kind of laser beam coming from the light uh, down to the child. My initial response was to be reminded of a description of the birth of Jesus in an ancient Jewish Christian apocalypse, the ascension of Isaiah, which played down the natural character of the birth of Jesus. In the ascension of Isaiah, which is a, a complicated work, which, which talks about Isaiah being taken up to heaven and uh, uh, c coming down again and seeing um, the divine son going down through the heavens and eventually uh, becoming, uh, 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 appearing to be human, that is, uh, and, and, and dying on a cross. In the description of the birth of Jesus in the Ascension of Isaiah, we read that after a pregnancy of only two months, Mary suddenly looks in astonishment and sees a small baby before her. After her astonishment at the appearance of the child, Mary's womb uh, became as it had been before she conceived. And my reaction on seeing this picture was to think, Wow, I wonder if Blake had a docetic Christology like the author of the Ascension of Isaiah, that is, uh, that Christ only appeared to be human and wasn't actually uh, fl flesh and blood. So that was my first reaction. My second reaction was the extraordinary child hovering between uh, the two women. And linked with the uh, tiny child, was uh, uh, just being aware, if I can get this to work again, of the enormous hands in relationship to the size of, of the child. It, and so the, 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 there were two reactions. First of all, how tiny the child was, and, and secondly, um, that the child was functioning in some sort of intermediary capacity uh, between the two women. I said yesterday uh, that I was only going to show you one other image by another artist, but there was a third impression that I had, and that was linking uh, the picture with Rembrandt's uh, Adoration of the Shepherds. Now, uh, I, I, I just kind of show you that, um, because uh, uh, there was the, the, the similarity of the, the light coming from the infant uh, immediately struck me uh, um, as being similar. Also... If I can get it here, let me, let me see if I can see it. Yes, just here, that peculiar uh, shape there, which you can see much more clearly in the picture, um, was like, uh, looks like a head. And I, I, I was aware of seeing a head there within the window. Um, now, uh, uh, subsequent research, and Martin Butlin in his study of William Blake's, Blake's paintings suggests that Blake might actually have seen a reproduction of Rembrandt. Uh, so it's not impossible that there might actually be some influence. So much then for my initial reaction. Let me now move on to the subsequent reflection, which included the following issues. Um, sorry, let me go back to the painting. The first question, though it's one subsequently that I've come to see as being of secondary importance, is... Uh, the identification of the individuals in the scene. There's the man and woman on the left, as you can see, with an elderly woman with a child on her lap. And between the two women is the celestial infant, with arms outstretched, floating between them, very small, as I've indicated. And above them, a window through which there is a heavenly cross-shaped light, and, as I've said, possibly a face in the light. It's presumably a nativity scene, evidenced by the oxen and the manger in the background, with presumably Joseph supporting a swooning Mary on the left. With regard to the identification of the characters, I'll not go through all the options, but outline the one that seems, uh, in the end, most convincing to me. Namely, 
that the characters mentioned in Luke 2, 6-7, Mary and Joseph, the Nativity itself, and the characters mentioned in Luke 1, 39-44, Elizabeth, and according, uh, uh, who according to Luke 1, 7 was barren and getting on in years, and the infant John, um, who of course in Luke 1 was still then in the womb. Blake writes elsewhere of Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth and Zechariah and John the Baptist being the Holy Family. So, I think what Blake has done here is merged characters from two Lucan accounts, the Nativity and the Visitation. But then there's the two children, the floating baby and the ruddy child. First thing to note is the difference in size, uh, which I suppose is readily explicable on the basis of a difference in age. But more noteworthy are the ruddy features of the child on Elizabeth's lap, if it is Elizabeth, um, which I think are stark in contrast to the tiny radiant child. If it is, as I think, the infant John sitting on Elizabeth's lap, a passage like Luke 7.28 springs to mind. Among those that are born of women, there is no greater prophet than John the Baptist. So, John is quite here, quite clearly, one who is born of women. So much for the components of the picture. I then set the pictures in the context of the Blake Corpus. And the first picture to mention is this Blake picture of the adoration of the kings. This was, according to the art historians, almost certainly painted as a companion to the nativity, where, as far as I can see, we have a much more conventional nativity scene with none of the peculiarities of uh, the uh, earlier nativity picture. The second image I just want to point you to is uh, uh, Zechariah and uh, Gabriel, Here's Zechariah in the temple, and uh, just to point you to this, because uh, uh, we've got that, uh, the heavenly light there in, uh, in the centre of the picture, as in the nativity, with Gabriel pointing towards it, watched by a rather sceptical and somewhat defensive Zechariah. <laughs> Most relevant of all is uh, this picture on the left here. This is um, Blake illustrating Milton. Milton's word is, uh, from uh, stanza three sent down the meek-eyed peace. This is the descent of peace, therefore, um, from uh, the uh, series on the Ode on the Morning of Christ's Nativity. Now, uh, I've put two versions up here. Uh, the one on the right hand, which is smaller, which is less relevant, is the one in Manchester. The one on the left is in the Huntington Library. And you can see there exactly the same components as turn up in the nativity picture. Um, the, the position in the picture has been reversed, but there on the right you've got Joseph supporting a swooning Mary, um, the, you've got the celestial child, much bigger, notice in this picture, hovering between uh, Elizabeth with John the Baptist on her lap, and there, presumably, in the background is Zechariah, and the other components uh, illuminating uh, uh, Milton's verse there. So uh, this uh, uh, illuminating uh, Milton's words, the descent of peace, uh, we've got peace being inaugurated between heaven and earth and between one human and another. The other image uh, that uh, I, I uh, found myself looking at is uh, this from Songs of Innocence and Experience. Um, the extraordinary airborne position of the celestial child who floods the stable with light uh, it, prompted me, uh, prompted a, a remembrance of some lines from Blake's poem, Infant Sorrow. My mother groaned, my father wet, into the dangerous world I leapt, helpless, naked, piping loud, like a fiend hid in a cloud. Now, fiend is not an obvious word that Blake would use to describe the heavenly Christ. And so I think uh, uh, the words from Infant Sorrow may caution us to read too much into the image and the nativity in the light of this all too down-to-earth scene depicted here. Back to the nativity and the issue of mediation, the Christ child mediating between uh, the two women. 
In later Blake works, we find reference to Christ as an intermediary linking and incorporating humans. Now, at the risk of setting up uh, of a whole lot of ideas when I show you the next image, I'm going to show you one of the initial plates from Jerusalem, which I mentioned yesterday. And uh, in the words starting here, we have the words linking Ephesians 5.14 and John 14.10. Awake, awake, O sleep of the land of shadows. Wake, expand. I am in you and you in me, mutual in love divine, and fibers of love from man to man through Albion's pleasant land. This theme for Blake of Christ as a divine environment, as a kind of mediating force in which humans can participate, linking them together, I think uh, in many ways analogous to Deuteropauline understanding of the cosmic Christ, but with the difference that for Blake all are included. Back to, I'll just state, leave that on for the moment, back to my initial reaction. Evidence that Blake may have known the ascension of Isaiah is difficult to come by. I've still got work to do to see whether he could possibly have known it. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't got as far as I would like with that. It is possible, however, that Blake may have read the Proto-Evangelium of James, which was available in English translation from 1726, which you've got there uh, both up on the screen and on the text. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't appear to have been in one library we, that we know Blake used, William Haley's in Felpham, um, uh, which we've got a list for, and it, uh, it wasn't there, unfortunately. But it's not impossible. Blake was uh, an intellectual jackdaw, quite capable of picking up all sorts of things. But in the description of Jesus' birth in the Proto-Evangelium of James, there are affinities with the ascension of Isaiah. The birth of Mary's child is described as a miraculous event. Cloud overshadows the cave where Mary is due to give birth, and after its disappearance, a great light shone in the cave, and after it diminished, the infant Jesus suddenly appeared and went to take the breast from Mary. In both the Proto-Evangelium and the Ascension of Isaiah, the unnatural character of Christ's birth seems to be described. The hidden celestial nature of the Saviour revealed, and Mary's astonishment at the sight of the small baby before her. In the light of all this, I think it's possible that Blake may at some point in his life have entertained ascetic Christological ideas, which we know were current in non-conformist circles in the early 18th century in England. A legacy of the influence of the ideas of Melchior Hoffman from the uh, 16th century, which uh, permeated into English non-conformity. But more plausible, I think, in the light of other Blake references, is Christ depicted as the bond between humans. Whether or not it's the age of Elizabeth is less important than the mediation which is taking place between the two women, which springs from the agony on the part of the one on the left to produce the bonds of love. Okay, so much for the nativity. Let's not just uh, quite leave that yet, because I just want to uh, look at another nativity scene. Back to Blake interpreting Milton's ode, on the morning of Christ's nativity, and I can't resist including this and its apocalyptic hue. Uh, these are the words of Milton, the old dragon underground in straighter limits bound swings the scaly horror of his folded tail in stanza 17. Here, I think, is the nativity linked with the vision of the woman clothed with the sun pursued by the red dragon from Revelation 12. Um, this uh, is a theme that Blake returns to again and again, and just two brief indications of that. Here is the, uh, um, the Whore of Babylon seated on the many-headed beast in uh, one depiction, but my favourite depiction is this one. Uh, once again, Blake illustrating somebody else's book, um, Edward Young's Night Thoughts, but I think what is extraordinary about this depiction of uh, the many-headed beast is that Blake uh, uh, um, follows 17th century radical interpreters who interpret the heads of the beast not of a succession of world empires, but of the present oppressive reality of church and state. Uh, uh, so you've got uh, the judge's wig there, the, uh, the uh, armed helmet, the king, uh, the papal tiara, um, the Bishop's Mitre and the Canterbury Cap all linked together. 
uh, you know, Blake taking the opportunity of uh, illustrating uh, the lines of a, of, of a conservative writer. Um, uh, goodness only knows what uh, the uh, publisher would have thought of it. <laughs> Still on the, uh, on the uh, infancy, uh, and once again uh, illuminating the uh, 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 Milton's Ode on the Morning of Christ's Nativity, what, what I, I, I wanted just to pick up here is, is the way in which um, Blake picks up uh, the circle here um, of the angelic host. Um, this is something that uh, he does very often. We'll see it coming up again in the Job sequence um, a little bit later. Um, and uh, it, this is the kind of archetypical um, uh, wheel picture. Um, his evocation of Ezekiel's throne chariot vision in the first chapter of Ezekiel, um, where uh, you've got that kind of circular motion there um, uh, with the eyes uh, in, uh, and, and uh, one, one or two of the creatures there in the circular motion. But what, what Blake has focused on is the human in the divine, the, the human in the divine st almost stepping out of the picture uh, to meet us there, you know, with the, one, one, one step forward. And you know, the, 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 the heads are uh, all human heads, and that kind of uh, the, the human in the divine, the divine in the human, such an important Blakeian theme. Other scenes now, um, a, a little bit more briefly. The baptism of Jesus, this, uh, which he did uh, on several occasions. This is the version which is in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Um, Blake inscribed the reference Matthew 3.16 on the mount of this, but it seems to me to follow more closely the account in the Gospel of John, where the visionary experience is vouchsafed to John, whose eyes here, you can see, are focused in, in heaven. And um, as with seven, several heavenly scenes, what we've got is an addition to the dove descending. Uh, what we've got here are these, uh, the angelic hosts there surrounding. Um, but John is the one who's got his eyes uh, looking up to heaven, um, uh, which is exactly what we've got in John chapter 1. Related to the baptism course, is the transfiguration. And uh, two things are striking about this. First of all, uh, the way in which the divine glory of Christ um, and to some extent Moses and Elijah there kind of rubs off on the disciples who are here. That is something which I think uh, um, Blake is kind of putting into the picture. Um, yeah, he, he read 2 Corinthians 3 as well as anybody, and my guess is that that's where he's getting it from. Um, the, the, the other thing, just to notice, because um, uh, we, we've seen it in the previous side, the slide, these kind of figures here. Um, are they the patriarchs, the heavenly host, or the heavenly alter egos of Moses and Elijah? I, do, I don't know. But... Um, they turn up again in another visionary experience, which is, strictly speaking, of course, not from the Gospels. This is the conversion of Saul, um, where Blake explicitly says, it's interpreting Acts 9-6, rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. And hence, um, the heavenly Christ pointing in the way in which he does. But notice, as in the previous picture, uh, what we've got here is the, is the yellow of, uh, of the ambience of Christ kind of rubbing off on Saul as he sees the heavenly vision. Once again, notice that we've got here the, uh, the faces surrounding Christ. Uh, uh, are they the heavenly host, as in Isaiah 6 or Revelation 4 and 5, or perhaps the Christians with whom Christ is linked, whom Paul is persecuting? Um, those figures kind of hovering around in the background also come up in this scene, this is uh, the, the judgment, the wisdom of Solomon. Um, and you can see, uh, arrayed behind Solomon, are uh, two sets of figures, each looking in different ways. Um, and one wonders whether what Blake is doing here is uh, kind of contrasting uh, the memory of tradition um, with the, the moment of inspiration. Here's the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon actually has to exercise the judgment for his, himself. There's nothing in the past because the opinion is divided. So here, the moment, 
he has to exercise uh, the wisdom of Solomon. Here we've got uh, the depiction of Christ's entry into Jerusalem. Definitely Matthew's version of the event. Uh, two animals you can see there. Uh, there, and two. And what, uh, what it, it, I think kind of clinches it, uh, if, uh, in addition to that, is the prominent place in the picture which are given to children. Indeed, one commentator calls this picture a children's crusade. Blake seems to have noted the distinction in the text between the crowds who chop down the branches and sing Hosanna and the disciples who accompany Jesus and put their garments on the animals. It's the children who lead the acclamation. And in Matthew's version, you remember, it's the children along with the physically impaired who greet Christ in the temple. Remember the, uh, Matthew 21, 14 to 16. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected prayers? Now, in Elsewhere in that response to the Reverend Dr. Trussler, which I mentioned earlier, um, Blake speaks of children as uh, possessing particular insight. And he talks of children who have taken greater delight in contemplating my pictures than I ever hoped. Then goes on to say, neither youth nor childhood is folly or incapacity. Some children are fools and some are so are some old men. But there is a vast majority on the side of imagination or spiritual sensation, he says. I think uh, uh, that emphasis uh, within that letter picks up an important contrast which Blake makes again and again between memory and inspiration. Uh, for example, in the famous prelude to Milton, and that echoes the importance of children in the synoptic gospels, particularly in Matthew. One of the most striking things about this picture is Blake's depiction of the children. Not only do they surround Jesus with the adult disciples, men and women, who, it is true, have halos depicted behind Jesus, but they also appear to be children who have the demeanour of adults. Just look at, look at um, these here. They, they look like kind of um, uh, uh, miniature adults. I think Blake sees the children in his imagination, whence comes inspiration, um, uh, and in that setting, the children, tiny of stature, become representatives of another world compared with that of the adults, a world of imaginative thought and understanding. Iconographically, I think, Blake indicates that despite their size, the children have the marks of true adulthood in their acknowledgement and recognition of Jesus. The pious devotion of the adults there in an attitude of prayer, contrast with the kind of enthusiasm of the palm branches in the hands of the children, immediately surrounding Jesus. As you can see, the sky is filled with the red sun, most likely in view of the setting immediately before the passion which is about to come. And indeed, the ruddy hue suffuses the whole of the picture. Like the brightness of the glory of Jesus in Blake's transfiguration envelops the disciples. So here, the events which are to come include those who surround Jesus. The welcome of the children as Christ enters Jerusalem mirrors the welcome Christ has given to children earlier in the Gospel. This is Matthew 19, 13 to 14. What is so striking is the position of Christ near the centre of the picture under a spreading tree. Although Christ seems to be rather detached rather than involved, there's no sense of barrier between him and the children who are gathered into his arms, perhaps echoing Isaiah 40, 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. Just briefly, the wise and foolish virgins. Um, a couple of things to point to here. Um, first of all, the way in which uh, Blake has brought in Matthew 24, 31, the angelic trumpet. 
the sombre hues, um, I think, uh, uh, are linked with this brief little indication here of what looks like, uh, to anybody from England, uh, the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, uh, Blake didn't like St. Paul's Cathedral because uh, it was classical architecture rather than Gothic architecture. Gothic ar architecture is about imagination. Uh, classical architecture for Blake is actually about kind of constriction, kind of uh, regularity and order. And uh, I think it's no accident that uh, we've got St. Paul's Cathedral there. Although we do have a couple of spires, so that might be pointing to something different. Here, the agony in the garden. In this depiction of Luke 22:43, Blake makes the event less a strengthening of Jesus in the light of the torment which is about to come, a seemingly almost a moment of rescue from rapture. The disciples, in contrast with the way in which they're part of the triumphal entry, are kind of mingled in, in, as into a kind of shadowy background here. You can just see it's not a brilliant reproduction. The angel appears left to be rescuing Jesus, as it were, from a sea or morass, removing him from suffering rather than strengthening him for it. What's very striking about the Blake depiction is the almost complete abandon that Jesus kind of, the attitude that Jesus has as he's embraced by the angel. And uh, it, it is very similar to the demeanor uh, apparent in uh, another design that Blake did for um, somebody else's work. Uh, this is entitled The Union of Soul and Body, which Blake did as a design uh, for Robert Blair's The Grave. But here you can see this is about uh, uh, the soul and the body being uh, reunited at death. And uh, uh, the, the, the similar kind of imagery, I think, is very striking uh, within the depiction of the agony in the garden. Here's the betrayal of Judas, uh, bringing together several biblical passages. Here Blake exploits the synchrony possible in an image to depict a succession of events. The moment of Judas' betrayal of Jesus in Gethsemane conflates the version in Matthew 26, 49, where Judas kisses Jesus, with John 18, 3, which refers to the detachment of soldiers with lanterns and torches, and John 18:10 where one of those with Jesus strikes with the sword. So it's, uh, there we have got, we've got uh, everything happening uh, at, the, uh, at the same time. And at the moment of arrest, when Jesus acknowledges, I am he, in John 18.5, those who are there fall backwards in John 18.6. And you know, that is, that, I think one can see that on the uh, right-hand side there. Once again, Blake portrays a serene Jesus, seemingly detached from what's going on. And it seems to me that Blake's view of Jesus is pervaded by the Gospel of John. And the Johannine Jesus seems always to be in control of events, not least as he journeys to Jerusalem, because he knows that his hour has come. And so to a depiction of the crucifixion. Here's one of Blake's depictions, which puts in the foreground the casting of lots over Jesus' garment. We don't actually see the crucified Jesus. It's a looming but radiant presence casting its shadow over the preoccupation of the all too human behavior in the foreground. But the image of the crucified Christ I want to focus on, it takes us back to Blake's Jerusalem, Plate 76, where, uh, which seems to me to uh, illustrate Blake's grasp of Johannine theology. We've no explanation of this, but I assume here that what we have in the foreground is that the human is Albion, the representative of Britain, with Jesus on the cross, are brought face to face. The radiance proceeding from the crucified Christ touches an Albion who imitates the crucified Christ by stretching out his arms. As we know, the glory of Christ crucified is an important theme of the Gospel of John. And this glory Christ shares with those whom the Father has given him, in John 17, 22. If you look here, you can just see here what seems to be fruit of a tree. It's, it's, it's a tree on which Christ is crucified. 
And I just wonder whether uh, what Blake has done here has actually juxtaposed the crucifixion with the tree uh, in the garden. Um, and here is the, the, the depiction of the temptation of Eve uh, with similar sorts of fruit there uh, depicted much more clearly. Um, I, I think the similarity um, is uh, uh, not accidental. I've touched on Johannine themes and I, I, I'm, I'm now just going to uh, have a little ten minute diversion, if I may, into, uh, in, into, the, into the Job sequence. Now, uh, I think anybody who talks about Blake and the Bible and uh, the life and character and teachings of Jesus uh, is bound to at least um, mention the Job sequence briefly. What I want to do, however, is before I get to the 1825 engravings, uh, which uh, you see here, uh, the uh, introductory page, I actually want to show you four images which are devoid of text uh, to start off. Just briefly to uh, I pick out... Uh, four images from the uh, uh, sequence of uh, um, watercolours that Blake did for Thomas Butts uh, ten years or so before he did the engravings in 1825. Uh, I will show you them with the minimum of comment. This is the first scene. Job and his family meet together. Um, Things that jump out to me are the books open on the lap, the instruments on the tree, the setting sun, and the, the words there are the opening lines of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is the last um, in the sequence. Um, Job may have got, kind of gone back to where he was before, but he's not, uh, and this is crucial for Blake, as we shall see, uh, he's not uh, quite where he was before. Um, he's standing up, uh, the instruments are off the tree, the books have gone, and the scrolls are there, and the sun is rising. As we shall see in a moment, uh, this is a crucial moment. This is um, the divine appearing to Job and his wife. And, and one, one of the things which is, which is really important about the whole of the Job sequence, whether in the, in the watercolours or the engravings, is that everything that happens to Job happens to his wife. That they are, are companions throughout the whole of the agony and then the ecstasy. Um, the, 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 the thing that is most striking to this is, is the kind of uh, the uh, uh, halo, nimbus, um, um, emanating from the divinity includes um, Job and his wife. Um, the comforters there on the right uh, um, are not quite included. And here um, is Job praying for his friends. Um, both, of, both of these two passages from Job 42. I, wanted to, I particularly wanted to show you this because uh, iconographically uh, this is different from what we shall see in the engravings. So this is now the engraving. So you can see the picture in the middle. And you know, what, what, what Blake is doing here is juxtaposing text and image as he does so often. But what is central is what you see. But, I mean, you know, like anybody else, my... my uh, uh, gaze immediately goes to the text and uh, I've spent so much of my time uh, looking at the text to interpret the images but I think you know, Blake has set it up like this because the, because the images are, are, are what, what, what are crucial now I'm, I'm not going to go through all the words here save just to, just to, to point you to you know, the major heading, thus did Job continually uh, you know, uh, th that is not a kind of uh, neutral statement for Blake. It's a statement about the fact uh, that uh, uh, Job had got into a habit of a religious life and actually uh, 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 was just accepting everything that uh, he'd received without questioning. And, uh, and the whole process of, uh, that, that he goes through is an upheaval where he moves from just accepting everything as a result of habit and actually learning uh, something different. Uh, just two things which, which are, are, are really important. The words there... Um, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6, 
but that's a killer the spirit of life, you know, kind of uh, 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 such an important text within the, um, the history of Christian interpretation. Added to which, he, he, he picks up some words from 1 Corinthians 2.14, which is spiritually discerned. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, really important text for Blake, I think, uh, uh, whether explicitly or implicitly. And here um, is the conclusion, the instruments of, 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 of the tree again. And uh, uh, the, the only thing that I want to draw your attention to here um, are, are the words on the altar. In burnt offerings for sin, thou hast taken no pleasure. So here's, here's a reference to uh, Hebrews 10.4, which he uses. And I think that kind of relates to uh, the fourth image, which I'll look at in a moment. But this... The next two are the reasons why I wanted to include something on Job, because I, I, I do think that this Job sequence is really important for any series of lectures on the life, character, and teaching of Jesus. Because what, what Blake does is interpreting the theophany to Job, um, he interprets that appearance of God as an appearance of Christ. Now, why is that? Oh, well, two things. I mean, here, here he's got his, his key hermeneutical verse, I have heard thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Um, but then, well, for the first time in the sequence, uh, we see the books open. Well, the books are open now outside the picture. And what do we find there? Quotations of the Gospel of John. A whole series of passages, I and the Father are one, he who has seen me has seen the Father, uh, I in you and you in me, uh, I and the Father are one, etc. So uh, uh, what, what seems to be uh, being said here, and this is a supplementary image to uh, the image of, uh, of God appearing in the whirlwind. Uh, he's interpreting um, the appearance to Job as an appearance of Christ. But l let it be said immediately, you know, the appearance, that he, that Blake is no exclusive interpreter. Christ is in everybody. And so uh, the possibility that uh, Christ uh, uh, might have appeared and be, uh, be found in people of uh, uh, different religions or none uh, is absolutely no problem to him at all. And then the, uh, the other image, and notice here in the engravings, um, uh, Job has his back to us, whereas in the watercolour he's facing us. Um, uh, in the watercolour, I think, more obviously kind of uh, uh, praying. Here, he could be offering sacrifice. But I think you know, this, this is a, a, a crucial moment in the sequence where, where Blake has picked up a reference in Job 42, contrasting Job praying for his friends and the friends offering sacrifice. And he includes, right at the bottom there, the Lord turned again the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. So, you know, it's not, it's not a mental conversion only. It is uh, something which is actually has to be acted out in the process of forgiveness. So, you know, back, back, we're back again with the forgiveness of sins. And there, what do we have in the open book? Um, passages from the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Okay. While we're on the Johannine, oh no, oh sorry, I've got, I've got, oh, there, was, there was another. Uh, let me just show you this. Um, uh, this is another um, Old Testament scene, Psalm 18. He rode upon the cherubim and did fly. Um, but I, I'm sure I wanted to show it to you because once again uh, there is this identification of, uh, of uh, Christ with the one who rode upon the cherubim. Um, uh, that. We can't be absolutely certain, but that most commentators think that, that is what is going on here. And uh, just while we're on the Johannine theme, I, I, I wanted to show you this remarkable picture of uh, the last judgment scene. Um, now, Blake sketched and actually did various last judgment scenes, and there's one enormous one uh, which is now lost. Um, this is in Petworth House in Sussex, the... Uh, owned by the, the people, oh, the, the place where it was originally intended for. Only quite tiny. I mean, uh, uh, I suppose it must be about a foot by six to nine inches, but packed with detail. 
Now, I, there's, there's not time to go into everything here, and there's just one major point uh, that I, I, I want to look at here, uh, but uh, just, to, just to point to some of their characters. There's Adam and Eve. There's the whole of Babylon. And the seven-headed beast. And uh, Christ, obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the empty throne apart from the cross. Um, what it actually reminds me of is that there is a, an empty throne apart from the cross in one of the Ravenna mosaics. Um, I, I'm sure Blake couldn't have known about that, but it, it is, it's quite striking. But the, the thing that I, I, I want, most want to draw your attention to, because I think it's so important in terms of what, the way in which Blake takes up uh, uh, ideas from the Gospels, is the way in which you can see here the difference in colour. The, the kind of dark gold on this side, and the light here. And what, what he's doing is what is happening is a kind of circular motion of people descending on this side into hell, the hell of judgment, and coming back, being snatched up with the Lord in the air up to share the glory of Christ. And you know, what, what, what Blake has done, I think, has, has radicalized that Johannine theme of judgment as something which has already taken place and uh, as something, an, an eschatological moment, which is repeated again and again in one's life. And so to, to finish with uh, the resurrection. This is an image which you can see if it's out in the Yale Centre for British Art. Um, a fairly conventional uh, resurrection appearance scene. Um, I assume that's Thomas there about to, uh, to put, stretching out his hand uh, to touch uh, the risen Christ. But there are some more remarkable depictions of the resurrection itself, which of course, as we know, is not reported in the New Testament. Um, here's one of the angel rolling away the the stone from the tomb and uh, Jesus about to be raised from the dead. And uh, even more remarkable and kind of not a million miles away from where we started with the nativity. Here is a, a depiction uh, Blake makes the reference to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4 um, Christ actually being raised from the dead and that moment taking place. Now I'm assuming that these are the, 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 the guards who are stunned by what has taken place uh, as Christ is raised from the dead uh, in, in, into his resurrection body. So this is the kind of echoing uh, those themes that I looked at with you in the everlasting gospel yesterday. But I think the most remarkable... Not quite resurrection, but I mean, uh, the, the, uh, an evocation of the, uh, of, of the events of the Passion is this picture of the angels hovering over the body of Jesus in the sepulchre. Uh, Blake explicitly uh, writes on the mount here, Exodus 25, verse 20. Um, passage has, Thou shalt make two cherubim of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubs on the two ends thereof. Verse 20. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look to one another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And this, I think, is the crucial verse. Uh, uh, for, uh, this is a bit, I think this is verse 23. There I will meet with thee, and I will com commune with thee from above the mercy seat. Blake's reference to Exodus 25:20 20 on the margin of the picture suggests to the viewer that the body of Jesus is the space where one can meet with God. Uh, now, this isn't some peculiar ecclesiastical environment, but is a possibility for anyone, which means for Blake, everyone created in the divine image. What I sought to offer is a survey of aspects of Blake's biblical hermeneutic in his pictures and an attempt 
to apply his interpretive method. They offer examples of the extraordinary creativity that is evident in his depiction of biblical images. No one more than Blake has experimented with the different effects in terms of space and time that text and image demand of the reader. And in his images, he shows himself to be a careful reader of the text who is able to express in the spatial and chromatic contrasts essential features of what he finds. Throughout his artistic career, Blake was aware of the problems posed by reading and interpretation and by the juxtaposition of text and image. He enabled a viewer and a reader to engage in an intellectual struggle to explore the hermeneutical complexity of text and image. Now, I, 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 I promise you that my choice of subjects was dominated by one concern, to give an impression of aspects of the life and teaching of Jesus from uh, birth to resurrection, as well as the range of Blake's, Blake's art. I didn't go looking for particular themes, but in retrospect, I think five themes uh, seem to me, actually, sorry, four themes seem to me to come up. First of all, in Christology. Even if my view of Blake's docetism turns out to be wrong, in several pictures, there's evidence of Jesus' detachment. One might put this down to, to Johannine influence, but at times Jesus seems to be above the fray of ordinary life. Secondly, as I said at the start, the themes of hearing and seeing, or memory and inspiration, are key to the Job series. The interest in visionary accounts reinforces this. Thirdly, the latter suggests the importance of the divine in human, as sight of God uh, involves also actually becoming divine. And finally, and we saw this coming up yesterday um, in the uh, everlasting gospel, there's the theme of Christ's body as an intermediary between humans, whether as an infant or as a dead person. Tomorrow, I'll try to pull together some threads from the previous uh, two lectures. Jesus was key to Blake's understanding of the Bible. As we've seen, what he thought set Jesus apart from all other religious leaders and philosophers was the forgiveness of sins. His Jesus was both a nonconformist and, to use Blake's words, acted from impulse, not from rules. Blake, I think rightly, has been regarded as one of the last of the antinomians. So tomorrow's lecture will start with a reflection on the importance of antinomianism as a significant part of the reception history of the New Testament. Secondly, Blake's life stands at a, an important moment in biblical interpretation, right on the cusp of uh, the Enlightenment move to a more historical approach. And I'll look at his relationship to emerging historical criticism and compare it with his own particular brand of biblical criticism, and briefly relate it to the groundbreaking account of the history of biblical hermeneutics sketched by Hans Frey. The lecture will conclude with some general reflections on Blake's biblical hermeneutics. Thank you. <laughs>